So let me tell you something really, really cool about Yupik language. Um, Yupik language is what's called a polysynthetic language, which if you've never heard that term before, uh, you're probably not a linguist. It's not really a term we use very often in everyday conversation. But polysynthetic language, I'm going to give you the technical definition and then the definition for people that aren't language nerds, like your professor. So the technical definition is languages where words have many morphemes. A morpheme is a word component with meaning. So for example, in the English word before, you have two morphemes, for and be. For is like to the front of, be is like um, proceeding, at least the way it's being used in that word. So um, to proceed in front of something else, essentially, be for. Um, English has morphemes, any language has morphemes. A polysynthetic language is one though where you put a lot of morphemes together to make words. So to put that in more practical terms, they are very complicated words that can say a lot in a single word. So let me give you an example. Kamigartuk, except for I'm doing the R kind of wrong, it should be more like Kamigartuk, with the R being having more of a um, kind of guttural sound to it. And that would mean he goes seal hunting with a small sled and kayak during spring. So that is one, two, three, really four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve different words wrapped up in twelve different English words wrapped up in one Yupik word. So we call that polysynthetic languages. And let me share with you um let's actually switch now if I'm able to what I'd like to do let me make sure. Okay, we're going to try to get you to hear these words and we will see if you can. So here are a few you pick words. So that means hi, what's up, how are you doing? It's like a farewell phrase, as they say. Like, stay as you are. Thank you for coming. Kuyana Dailuchi. E. E. Which means yes. So, as you can see, that is a language where um, the morphemes, the sounds, the basic phonemes, the basic sounds of the language sound very different than they do in English. So, for example, R's sometimes have more of a guttural sound, as sometimes do Q, uh, and it in general sounds quite different than English. Uh, and it's a language that is very complex and you can do a lot with, um, every language is complex and you can do a lot with, just you pick is a very interesting language. Um, some of its words just pack so much information into one word. So for example, a rock, um, ash made from a birch tree fungus or other special plant products then mixed with chewing tobacco, um, or um, cotton gulk half sibling through a formerly traditional spouse borrowing relationship. So you have these some words that are just very specific, very, very specific types of phenomena. You have other words that are really, really broad, like Ella, world, outdoors, weather, universe, awareness, sense, kind of just the divine universe. It's a lot of things. Um, so words can be very flexible. They can also be incredibly specific. Now, another interesting thing about Yupik language, in addition to its polysyntheticness, in addition to its flexibility, is the fact that Yupik um, this is sort of something about language, Yupik language and Yupik culture, which is the tendency, and I think it was in the Hamilton reading where they talked about this, but the tendency to frame things that you're saying oftentimes when you're talking about, for example, traditional teachings, traditional knowledge, uh, cultural practices, or just things in general, to preface them by saying something along the lines of, I heard such and such, or the common phrase, can over it, which means, what they said. So what they said was, you know, Joe went to the store the other day and hung out with Sally. So it's kind of this distancing, in a sense, or an acknowledgement that your knowledge doesn't come from your own direct observation, but that you're talking about knowledge which you gained from hearing it from other people. So that could be something, like I said, kind of minor, like talking about something that happened in the community that you didn't directly observe, or it could be talking about something really major, like traditional teachings about reincarnation. And both of those might fall under somebody saying sort of, well, what they said is, or I have heard it this way. And that's actually, there's a way to linguistically mark that. So very often in the words, you're going to attach... Um, G-G-U-K-I, which I think is pronounced kind of hook, um, which is a suffix, something you can kind of put at the end of a word, which means kind of apparently, or this is what was said. 
we call that in linguistics, we call that an evidential marker, which if you want to seem really cool at a party, just start throwing words like evidential marker and polysynthetic around, and I'm sure you'll be a hit. Uh, but evidential marker is when you have built into a language parts you can attach to a word that indicate where you got the information from or how sure you are of it. And that's sometimes a hard concept for English speakers to come to grips with, at least it was for me, because that's not really how English works. There are ways of saying that, but you usually like have to say a whole sentence to say it, right? Like, I heard that Joe went to the store. There's not a way to say, like, Joe went to the store, and then the word went has like an extra little sound on it that says, um, I heard from somebody else, right? That's not the way English works. I mean, I guess you can kind of be like, Joe went to the store? Which kind of implies ambiguity, but it still doesn't really imply where you got the information from. So, um, evidentials are very, very interesting. And I think they're interesting not just because, oh, cool, a cool thing you can do with language, but also because it says something about the culture. If you noticed in the Kowagli reading, for example, um, there was a strong emphasis on sort of what I've been taught by others, and specifically my knowledge is specific to my family's knowledge traditions. I'm not trying to speak for all you pick people. So there's this tendency to stop speaking in absolutes, as we sometimes do, about just sort of it is, which is often how we speak in English, and instead kind of it is as we understand it, right? Kind of a distancing from absolute universal knowledge and more of an acknowledgement of the limit of your knowledge when you're talking about your knowledge, which I think is really interesting. And it makes me think of what's called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. So add that to your bag of words that you now have. Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, evidential, polysynthetic, you're going to sound really cool now. And Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, though, is a theory within linguistic anthropology and anthropology in general, which states that language shapes how we think. And there is evidence for and against that premise. Um, I would call it partially true. Um, but the, if we were to apply that in this case, does lang if language shapes how you think, does the use of things like, well, apparently this happened, or I heard this happened, does that cause one to perhaps be more humble about one's knowledge because your language is constantly reminding you of where you got the knowledge from and the fact that you didn't directly observe that specific thing you're talking about? I don't know. It's an interesting thought. Or maybe it goes the other way around. Maybe because your culture has sort of that kind of humility towards knowledge and that relativism towards knowledge, maybe that then gets reflected in the language. Either way, it's interesting.